Hi, I am Ajit Virkud, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology from Mumbai. Hello citizens of the internet. Today I am going to discuss a very important topic, preeclampsia. It is going to be a long e-lecture and I have divided it into three parts. In the first part, I am going to discuss what is preeclampsia exactly and its epidemiology. In the second part, I am going to prevail on its pathophysiology. And in the third part, I will discuss the management of this dreadful disease. The first thing to remember is that preeclampsia is a pregnancy specific disorder. It is one of the leading causes of maternal morbidity and mortality throughout the world, second only to postpartum hemorrhage. It is also responsible for iatrogenic preterm delivery leading to a lot of neonatal morbidity and mortality. It is the most important and common medical complication of pregnancy. It is a devastating disease. About 50,000 to 60,000 preeclampsia related deaths per year are reported worldwide. Mortality in preeclampsia is just the tip of the iceberg. What lies beneath is the near miss morbidity. For every maternal death, there are 50 to 100 women who experience near miss significant morbidity that results in significant health risk and health care cost. The disease continues to challenge us. According to ACOG, the main reason for this alarmingly high preeclampsia morbidity and mortality statistics is less than optimal care that is given to the patients throughout the world and India is no exception to this. As Pogo said, we have seen the enemy and it is us. We can and should make a difference. The prevalence of preeclampsia is 5-7% to in the developed world. But in developing countries like India, it may be as high as 15%. The incidence of preeclampsia has increased by 25% in United States in the last two decades. As far as the classification of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy is concerned, we have gone back to the original 1972 ACOG terminology, the one we used when I was an undergraduate student. There are four types, preeclampsia, chronic hypertension of any cause predating pregnancy, preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension and gestational hypertension. This classification does not include one more type we see sometimes, postpartum hypertension. Some patients with no preeclampsia in the antenatal period or labor suddenly develop significant hypertension after delivery, usually within 48 hours. One more thing. Gestational hypertension patients are evolving and they may progress to preeclampsia later on. What it means is that these classes are not watertight. It has been observed that 40% of patients with only new onset hypertension or only new onset proteinuria with no hypertension will later develop classical preeclampsia. Now, let us see what is significant hypertension. Criteria for diagnosis of significant hypertension are systolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 140 millimeters of mercury, that is Korotkov's phase 1, and diastolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 90 millimeters of mercury, Korotkov's phase 5. It should be documented on at least two occasions more than six hours apart but not more than one week apart. There is one change in our understanding of the disease. It was thought that in preeclampsia, diastolic hypertension is more important than systolic hypertension and should be aggressively controlled. Recent studies however show that in patients who had mortality that is cardiovascular accidents like strokes due to severe preeclampsia had systolic blood pressure greater than 160 millimeters of mercury. Now we should also focus on controlling systolic hypertension. 
both are equally important. Now let us see what is significant proteinuria. Significant proteinuria is loss of 300 mg or more of proteins in urine per 24 hour urine collection or protein to creatinine ratio greater than or equal to 0.3 mg per deciliter or dipstick reading of 1 plus or more if other quantitative methods are not available. What is gestational hypertension? Currently, the term gestational hypertension is used for women who develop significant hypertension without proteinuria or any end organ damage after the 20th week of gestation in a previously normotensive woman. It is of two types, mild which is systolic blood pressure of 140 to 160 millimeters of mercury and or diastolic blood pressure of 90 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Severe which is systolic blood pressure equal to or greater than 160 millimeters of mercury and or diastolic blood pressure equal to or greater than 110 millimeters of mercury. Remember, there is no such thing as moderate gestational hypertension. As I have written in my textbook Modern Obstetrics, second edition, preeclampsia is not just significant hypertension with significant proteinuria. Instead, significant hypertension associated with any organ damage should be called preeclampsia. As you know, preeclampsia is a multi-organ disorder and when significant hypertension causes damage to various maternal organs like kidney, brain, lungs and or placenta, it is called preeclampsia. I will explain why hypertension with proteinuria was considered preeclampsia earlier. Recent studies have revealed that vascular endothelial growth factor is highly expressed in the kidneys. This is why the commonest organ to be damaged in preeclampsia is the kidney, leading to proteinuria and therefore hypertension with proteinuria was erroneously considered to represent preeclampsia. I will elaborate on this in detail later. To reiterate what I just said, significant hypertension with any organ damage is called preeclampsia. It is important to understand what are the risk factors for preeclampsia. The maternal risk factors are age less than 18 or greater than 35 years, primary gravida, primary paternity that is first conception with a new partner, chronic hypertension, diabetes mellitus, family or past history of preeclampsia or gestational hypertension, and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. The fetal factors are multiple gestations, polyhydramnios or oligohydramnios, vesicular mole, and RH isomenization that is any condition which is associated with a large edematous placenta. In the past, preeclampsia was classified as mild and severe. This is no more true. ACOG now recognizes preeclampsia as preeclampsia without severe features and severe preeclampsia. There is no such thing as mild preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is a bad disease and the term mild is discouraged. So then, what is severe preeclampsia? Preeclampsia with any one or more of the following conditions is referred to as severe preeclampsia. Systolic blood pressure equal to or greater than 160 millimeters of mercury or diastolic blood pressure equal to or greater than 110 millimeters of mercury. Thrombocytopenia that is platelet count less than 100,000 per ml, impaired liver function, progressive renal insufficiency, pulmonary edema, and new onset cerebral or visual disturbances. It is important to note that 5 grams proteinuria criteria has been eliminated 
because the amount of proteinuria does not appear to have an effect on maternal or fetal outcome. Severe preeclampsia along with HELP syndrome and eclampsia are referred to as the deadly triad. It is called so because this is often associated with the following adverse outcomes. Preterm delivery, renal failure, placental abruption, fetal and or maternal death, hematoma in liver and recurrent preeclampsia. This is the end of part 1 of my e-lecture on preeclampsia. For further reading on this topic and other topics in obstetrics and gynecology, refer to following books written by me. Practical Obstetrics and Gynecology Modern Obstetrics Modern Gynecology Clinical Cases in Obstetrics Questions and Answers Clinical Cases in Gynecology Questions and Answers and Pelvic Reconstructive Surgery If you have found this video useful and informative please subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking here